It's a Locked On crossover edition between Locked On Cougars and Locked On Baylor. That man right there is Drake Toll. What's up, Drake? Jake, football, football. this weekend. Yes. We have a top 25 showdown between the Cougars and the Bears, a rematch from last season. We're going to dive into it on today's edition of Locked On Cougars and Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch. That man right there is Drake Toll. I'm the host of Locked On Cougars. Drake is the host of Locked On Baylor. And you know what? When the two teams clash, we get to talk about it. How are you, buddy? Dude, it is Baylor is 0-0 zero, zero right now because last week's game was an effective scrimmage against an FCS team. So I like I wish that I could tell you what I learned about Baylor football, but it's it's like it's so nominal after that game. However, now you see BYU go against Gary Bohannon again and then just beat the crap out of those guys. I, I am in ultimate college football mode right now. That is how I am. Jake Hatch, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I just want a quick reminder for everybody that uh, today's show is brought to you by our title sponsor, LinkedIn. We'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs is helping you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Drake. I got to first off, uh, we're going to dive into this match between the Bears and the Cougars. But I, First off, what an outfit. Yeah, man. I look for our for our folks out in Utah, in the Provo, Salt Lake, wherever you may be coming from. This this is what you're getting this weekend. Right. This is Texas right here. It's coming at you. If you're listening on on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you're not getting the full effect today. But just know that I'm in chaps right now and a sequined shirt and a cowboy hat because that's what this show called for. It's the biggest one of the year so far. I actually feel underdressed. I'm not going to lie here. So we'll, we'll, we'll make do regardless though. So uh, Drake, if you don't mind, I'm going to start off by asking you some burning questions about the bears ahead of this matchup. And I'm going to let yeah. you fire off at me. So I want to start with this. You mentioned the fact you felt like it was a glorified scrimmage uh, between the Albany great yeah. Danes and the Baylor bears in week one. Uh, my, my first question is because BYU fans just saw Gary Bohannon go up against BYU for the second straight year, albeit he was the starting quarterback for USF and BYU Handled that game pretty easily. I felt like Gary Bohannon's wide receivers let him down. Can you give us some insight as to what you saw from Blake Shapin in game one, potentially, that kind of leads you to think why they decided to go with Shapin over Gary Bohannon? Yeah, Jake, I'm going to give you first insight on the Baylor Albany game. When I opened my show on Monday, the first thing that we talked about was the the things that we weren't impressed with with Baylor because we okay. were really excited about the offensive line, the defensive line, the one area it feels like if Baylor's going to win the Big 12, that's where they're going to make their bet. And they just were underwhelming. Game one, whatever, but you're playing Albany. How do you how do you be underwhelming against Albany as one of two of the best units supposedly in the nation? But if there was one bright spot, it was Blake Shapin. The guy can take it over the top. His deep ball is impeccable. That was the big thing on Twitter, too, was people just going over and over. The deep ball is back in Waco. Baylor has a quarterback that can launch the ball deep. Charlie Brewer wasn't great at it. Gary Bohanna was inconsistent. Blake Shapin has an impeccable deep ball. That's going to be huge to take the top off, make you respect the run a lot more. Love seeing that on Saturday. He's the truth. Shapin's the truth. Now, will he stay healthy the whole year? Will he be 100%? Will the wear and tear get to him at some point? I, I think you can make a case for yes. But right now, Blake Shapin firing on all cylinders reminds me a lot of Zach Wilson, who mm. played quarterback for the BYU Cougars, whose offensive coordinator was Jeff Grimes, who has now turned Blake Shapin into what he is today. Well, and that's what I want to ask you about Jeff Grimes. How has he gone about... Um, I guess making or remaking this offense to accentuate what Shapin's got at his disposal. Yeah, you've heard the the term wide zone a <laughs> whole lot over the last few years. And so probably like really, the last six at BYU, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've gotten plenty of the wide zone and what it is and the ins and outs. And we studied a lot of BYU and Jeff Grimes came to Baylor and how he built the offense for Zach Wilson. Would Zach Wilson have been an elite quarterback had he played for Utah? My answer to that is no. I think Jeff Grimes was a huge part in the development of Zach Wilson. He is a quarterback whisperer. I truly believe that. And so the wide zone opens up the opportunity to build your offense around your quarterback. Even if his arm is not elite, you can create 
Gary Bohannon-esque moments where it's like, all right, you don't need an elite arm to make this play. So Shapin's in an offense where he feels really comfortable. And when you build an offensive line like Baylor has under Eric Mateos, where transfers and even younger guys have been able to step up into four or five starters returning this season, a lot of confidence in Shapin with the O-line in front of him, even though they weren't as bright as I expected them to be against Albany. That's what has made Shapin so comfortable and worked so well for him is that Mateo Grimes, that combination, the wide zone, parlay it all together. Shapin just feels really safe in this offense, and that goes a long way for QB. I wanted to ask you about his ability in the play action game. That was something that Zach Wilson, you, you compared the two of them. Zach Wilson was deadly in 2020 uh, running yeah. play action off of that wide zone concept. They, they would they would play action off of it and Zach would come on a boot or he would just drop back and he was just absolutely firing on all, all cylinders at that point. How do you feel shaping his uh, fit in? I know it's early on. They've only played one yeah. game. but How do you think he fits in with that r- with regards to the play action game? Jake, when Blake Shapin stepped on campus, I remember remarking that he was a better baseball player than he was football player. He was honestly a better baseball recruit than he was a football player. And that seems to be a trend with a lot of these guys. You're Kyler Murray's of the world. You're like, well, he's a better baseball player. Why is he going to play football? And for Shapin, he throws the ball like a shortstop. Play action, it's a lot like Zach Wilson. The play action, and then the guy's bootlegging or rolling out, and you're like, that that looks like a shortstop coming across the baseball diamond, and then firing that football off the back foot. That's what you're getting right now from Blake Shaven. He has been elite in the play action game. Is is his timing 100%? I don't believe so. Is he going to fool the heck out of a defense right away? Not yet. I, I don't believe he's comfortable enough to be at that level of a play-action quarterback. But once he gets rolled out into space, he can make a play happen down the field. He can check down to a, to a guy running a slant. He can run the football himself. He will not slide, by the way. So one big hit, and the guy's – he took a couple against Albany. So that's, that's really – they're going to have to do that day in, day out, tell him to slide. But he's – embraced the the wide zone and especially the play action aspect of the wide zone to a T. Now, with regards to weapons around him, we all know Baylor was was locked and loaded last year. BYU fans got an up close view of that. Obviously, that yeah. game in Waco. Uh, how have they gone about replenishing the running back position, some of the wide receivers, that that type of stuff this year? Yeah, that's that's the big question is name a running back, name a receiver for Baylor. I ask that every time I do a crossover and every other host says I can't. And it, that's no knock on these hosts. They're also knowledgeable. It's the fact that Baylor has really no big names in either the wide receiving core, or the running back core. So it's wide receiver by committee, running back by committee. The wide receiver group standpoint, you'll hear a lot of Monterey Baldwin. He was electric both through the air and on the ground against Albany on Saturday, had a 50 yard carry for a touchdown, had a couple of touchdowns in total. And then you got guys on uh, at the running back spot like Tay McWilliams and Richard Reese and Quaylen Jones and Squirrel Williams. It's like you're picking together. There were four guys for Baylor that you really felt like had a, a solid game for the Bears running the football on Saturday. And that might be it the whole season. Will a guy even emerge by week six as the guy at running back? It didn't happen last year. Tristan Ebner and Abram Smith were a two-headed running back system. Baylor's going to do that again. Do they have Tristan Ebner and Abram Smith? I don't think anybody is that caliber yet out of this running back or receiver group like Tyquan Thornton was at receiver. So there's still a ton to replace there. But Blake Shapin is kind of your saving grace. The offensive line, those are your saving grace in that the big names aren't there on the skill position side of the football. But your O-line, your quarterback are good enough where it's not going to matter as much as you might think it would. Now, flipping over to the defense for a moment here, a lot of people here in Utah know Siaki Ika, uh, Apu Ika, because of his time at East High School. He actually committed to BYU originally mm-hmm. before ultimately opting to go to LSU and then transferring to uh, to Baylor. Uh, besides him, how is the defense looking? Defense was was solid. That was the one group that I was underwhelmed by, was the defensive line. Siaki Ika, uh-huh. Gabe Hall, Jackson Player. There were all these huge names, the guys that I did the math, and at one point, Three Baylor players combined for a sack. It was a total of 900 pounds coming down on the Albany quarterback. That's the size of a grand piano. Yeah. This team is massive, but the D-line was a little underwhelming. Siaki Ika is still an All-American caliber player. He was frustrated after the game with his performance, it's felt like. But the secondary stepped up in a big way. They are replacing a lot of guys. Uh, and so I, I just don't know how good they're going to be down the stretch, but they look solid against you, Albany. The linebacker core is old, experienced. They're still really good. The defense is where this team makes it. It's bad. They are going to play at some point this season a 21 or a 24 to 17 or 24 to 14 game where the defense steps up because that's the unit, in my opinion, this year. 
All right, Drake, I'm going to flip the tables. You're going to ask me some questions about BYU from the Baylor perspective. Before we do that, though, we do need to talk about our friends over at LinkedIn. Of course, they're one of our great sponsors from the Locked On Podcast Network. As you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can create a free job post in just minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond with the world's world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Simple tools like screening questions questions will make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you would like to interview and hire. That is why small businesses are rating LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs is helping you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers are visiting LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars and Locked On Baylor your first listen of the day. We always appreciate you guys checking out the show wherever you get it. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google. You all all know the drill. I think at this point, don't they, Drake? Yeah, I I think everybody's pretty much on board with uh, with finding Locked On Baylor, Locked On Cougars, which great content, by the way, even last week going to the USF. I was watching a lot of that, Jake. You kill it, as always. And we over here are doing our best to cover those Baylor Bears as they, uh, you know, top 10 team going into, into this season. And for me, Jake, when I think about BYU, I think consistency under Kalani Sataki and what he's been able to build there the last few years, especially with Jeff Grimes and a lot of mutual respect between these two teams. Aranda talked about it in the Monday press conference. He is coached alongside or under most of the BYU staff. They all know each other. Going into this game, a lot of mutual respect between these two teams. I just want to know, my burning question, is this BYU team better than last year's BYU team? And if so, by how much? Well, if you want a one game sample size, sure, Uh, I'll I'll give you that. And that's the thing about USF. They came out and just from the get go, the very first play, Pukunakua takes to the house 75 yards on a a zone read, not zone read, uh, uh, whatever, 75 yard run scores right off the bat. And from that point on, BYU was in full control of this game. It literally felt from the get go. They endured a two and a half hour rain delay, uh, well, more lightning delay. That's what it was down there in Tampa. But they got through that. It was 28 nothing at the end of the first quarter. And at that point, BYU went on cruise control. I went back and rewatched the game. I do a film review Monday every week on the podcast to kind of look back at the game on a second viewing. And really, after the first quarter, I was like, well, BYU not, not showing anything. They were doing inside and wide zone concept run game. They, they didn't do anything special after the first quarter of that game against USF. So on a one game sample size, maybe in a, even a one quarter sample size, the offense in particular, I feel like is improved. It looks like it is ready to absolutely uh, show what it flex really some muscle this year. Defensively, they had some issues, but I thought overall there was progress made. Jake, last year, it was bigger, faster, stronger for Baylor. That's how they beat BYU down the stretch, just the level of athlete. And Sataki said it in the postgame press conference. That's a team that was just larger than we were and had better athletes. And when it comes down to it, that's going to win you more football games than not if you're just better at that level than, than another team. This year, it feels like things may be evening out as Baylor figures out skill positions across the board. Is this BYU team, if not better even, bigger, faster, stronger to the caliber of an athlete at a a power five school, which BYU I would consider to be, and they will be soon. Yeah, they've endeavored to do that. I actually had a conversation with Josh Larson. He's a reserve defensive lineman right now. I thought he might push for a starting job, and at some point this season, he may very well do that. But, Drake, he told me at the, during the Baylor game last year, he was forced into action in that game. He was playing defensive tackle for BYU in that matchup at 260 pounds. That is way underweight for a defensive tackle at any level of football yeah. that plays at the collegiate level. Well, he said after that game, the BYU coaching staff told all of the offensive and defensive linemen, guys, that Baylor team is what we aspire to be. That's what you guys need to get to. You guys need to work in the offseason, gain the requisite weight, build on your strength, et cetera. Josh Larson, for example, packed on 50 pounds this season. I had a chance to talk to him during training camp in Provo, and the 50 pounds was not 50 pounds of pizza. I can tell you that much. Yeah. He, he, he is he, – he, he had a six pack. He said until three months ago. He said and it, it, he said the goal is to have the six pack back again at 310 pounds. What he weighs right now, we'll yeah. see if he can get to that. But that's the thing, though. There is a significant size change on both the offensive and defensive lines for BYU. They, they understood that hey, we were undersized a year ago. Baylor bullied us in the trenches. We will not let that happen again. Ultimately, we'll find out Saturday if the work they did in the off season will yield results. But I just the eye test. They look bigger. 
Jake, Jaron Hall, go. Uh, the next first round quarterback taken out of the BYU football program. Uh, for one game, he looked very, very good. He did have a bad interception that he threw against USF where he, I think, just didn't see a safety sitting un underneath in coverage and tossed it into double coverage and was picked off. Outside of that, though, he completed passes to 12 different receivers in that game against USF on 25 completions. He was spreading the wealth. Uh, the most receptions were four by Cody Epps. The most yards was 41 yards by Chase Roberts. It was, a, and the funny thing is, he only had Puka Nakua for half of a quarter in that game. He injured his yeah. ankle in the first half of that uh, first quarter, and they sat Puka the rest of the way. Gunnar Romney the other star receiver for BYU didn't even play against USF, and they held up just fine. I know it's USF. Baylor's a completely different animal when it comes to defensive philosophy because USF, that wasn't it. I can tell you that much just having watched that game. They they were over overmatched in that matchup. But the nice part is it appears that new weapons are emerging for BYU on the perimeter at wide receiver, tight end, et cetera. The hope is that those new weapons will pay dividends this week if either Puka or Gunner are, are unable to go because as of yet, we don't know what their status is, and I would expect we will not know until game time Saturday night. Yeah, that was my next question, the, kind of the big one for, for Baylor fans right now. And even Aranda was asked about this Monday in the press conference. Injuries for BYU, and not a toll it's taken on the team early, but at least how Kalani Sataki and company have had to adjust through the first game and the first couple of weeks going into this Baylor game. Is there really any concrete update on Nakua or Gunnar Romney? Uh, Kalani Sitake said during his press conference Monday that he would know later in the week. And he, he he's here's the thing. I've been around BYU for over a decade at the po this point in my career, covering them day in and day out. Uh, I can tell you this much. They are going to defer, defer, defer until literally game time Saturday night. They'll keep saying, well, we're hoping to have them back. We'll, we'll see, blah, 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 blah. They're going to just say everything that they have to say to defer until they get to Saturday night. It is my hope that at least one of them plays. I would assume that Nakua uh, will do everything within his power to play. The same thing with Gunnar Romney. The issue will be they've got to convince the sports science and the, the medical team at BYU that, they, that they're good to go. They have to sign off on it, obviously, as well as the team doctors. But if they're able to go, uh, it's going to be very important for BYU's chances. The one other uh, injury concern out there is Gabe Summers, one of BYU's top defensive tackles. I uh, look at like he lowered his uh, lower injured his lower leg against USF. He never returned to the game. We don't know on his status either. Wow. So injuries obviously could play a, a big role into this game for, for both teams. For Baylor, it's it's the idea that uh, the squad is fairly healthy to this point, but also your first game, everybody's cramping. Everything, you know, I mean, everybody's got some kind of rust. And from a sports media standpoint, it's like, wow, we saw five guys go down. I think they were all cramps. And then Saturday rolls around and you're like, oh, two guys are out. So we'll see what happens from the Baylor standpoint going to Saturday. But I want to really hammer in our in our last 10 minutes or so the atmosphere at BYU. I'll be in Provo this weekend. You and I will get to catch up there. But that is my yeah, kind of in the same way that that I pitched you, uh, Jaron Hall, the mm -hmm. BYU atmosphere at 9 p.m. Central Time on a Saturday night. Uh, you'll be surprised. It'd be the most rowdy, sober crowd you've ever been around in your entire <laughs> life. And I, I mean that sincerely because BYU is affiliated with the LDS Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Most of your Baylor fans will know it as the Mormon Church. Uh, and by and large, most of the adherents to that religion don't drink alcohol. But they, yeah. they, they, they like to get loud. They like to get rowdy at these games. They're going to have some fun, and they're excited. I think they're nearing a sellout as of recording of this podcast. They hope to have the place packed. They can pack more than 63,000 fans into Lavelle Edwards Stadium when it's packed to the gills. I'm sure there's going to be a he healthy contingent of Baylor fans making their first trip out. I'm assuming, Drake, this is going to be your first trip to the Wasatch Front. Is that right? I have never been to Utah, Jake. It's right. like one of my few states that I've still got to check off. And we're doing it in Provo. Well, here's the thing. You're going to be absolutely mesmerized by the mountains. They are right on top of Lavelle Edwards Stadium. It, it, for my money, it's maybe the best backdrop for all of college football. Uh, the, the Y up on the mountain is right there. And obviously, like you mentioned, we're going to catch up. Uh, the nice part is BYU's got an emerging tailgate scene, uh, albeit without alcohol. There's a lot of people out there grilling and having a good time in the lead up to game time. They actually have a really cool thing outside of the stadium, just to the west of the stadium. They actually close off an entire street, and they call it Cougar Canyon. And it's got all kinds of booths, games, food, etc., that you can go and peruse if you're a Baylor fan coming into town. And the good news is BYU and the surrounding areas got a plenty of places to eat as well. And if
if you do want to imbibe, I, I, I probably should acknowledge this as well. If you are a Bears fan coming in who wants to get their alcohol, there are multiple bars in the local area that you can go to. Uh, for example, Wisconsin came to BYU in 2018, and they actually drank one of the bars dry, the Wisconsin oh. Badger fans. So uh, there's a legacy there to live up to for Baylor fans if they really want to live up to it. Jeez. Well, Jake, you know what they say, where there are four Baptists, there's bound to be a fifth. So that, I can't. <laughs> It's funny you said you said booths. I thought you said booze for a second. You know, everybody kind of perks up out there. Uh, it's it's not really the ba- you know Baylor fans are pretty tame themselves, but those yeah. Texans they get the the eccentric outfits. I I asked if I could wear this in the press box and was given a very direct no by Sports <laughs> Illustrated. So I will not be in my sequins and cowboy hat very sadly on Saturday. Let let me add one more thing. Um, are you a big fan of uh, maple like maple bars? Uh, Jake, yes. Okay, there's a thing called a cougar tail. It, 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 it's unique to BYU football games. It's a two and a half foot long maple bar, folks. Oh, jeez. It is incredibly delicious, but it is a whole lot of uh, maple bar. I've only ever been able to finish about half of one, so I would encourage any uh, Drake. Uh, we'll get you one. You can try it out. Obviously, we'll take care of you on that front. But also, if you're coming out to this game, you need to try the maple bar. I would encourage you to share it between two or three friends, though. Mm, I love it. Jake, this is, uh, I can't wait. It's going to be one of the more fun road trips that I, I'd say I'd ever been on, uh, as well as the rest of Baylor media and the Baylor fans that are going, because there is this mutual respect between both fan bases, too. BYU, it was 60-40 Baylor fans last year on Baylor's homecoming. BYU had 40% of the stadium, and it was just loud. So there's there's a lot of respect between Baylor fans, BYU fans. The religious affiliations, too, go a long way for both fan bases as well. And how do you see this one shaking out on Saturday? Uh, so here's the thing. BYU has a revenge factor from last year's game. They obviously felt like they got a beat thoroughly. Kalani Satake acknowledged it in the postgame. He's like, we didn't necessarily expect it to perform the way that we performed. There is a revenge factor in play for this game. BYU wants to re- kind of reassert themselves and say, you know, we can compete with, with Baylor. We want to be what Baylor is. We want to compete with them on a game-in and game-out basis. The question I have is, will they be able to harness that revenge factor the right way? Because there, there's a lot of times that you can say, hey, we want to get revenge. We want to get payback, et cetera, where you get way too hyped and all of a sudden like you're you're overplaying on a certain play or you're mi- make, missing a read. That type of stuff cannot happen in a game like this. The one thing I love about Dave Aranda and the way he operates Baylor is they're cold and uh, I mean cold in a bad way. They're kind of shrewd. They're manipulative. They just do things in a cold manner. And, and the funny thing is I call Dave Aranda the latter day Lavelle Edwards. He His expressions do not change on the sideline. Anybody who watched yeah. Lavelle Edwards for the three decades he was per, uh, perusing, B, well not per, perusing, prowling BYU sidelines, he looked a lot like what uh, you saw, what you see from Dave Aranda. No up or down, no nothing. Just it's the same look all the time. And that's what I love about Baylor. They play to the the kind of the mentality or the, I guess the stoicism that I see from a guy like Dave Aranda. And that's a great, great thing to have. This is a team that just goes out there and does their thing. Stone Cold Killers. Baylor yeah. is, is that, that's how I describe Dave Aranda. He's not a mean person, no. but. Man, he's just got that, that he's got a different brain and a different style. Tom Landry asked as well for the sure. Texans out there yeah. listening. And to me, it's that's the first thing that I thought of was for BYU, do they come in overhyped for this game? Night game at home. Every the place has got to be packed out. It's a top 20 matchup. It looks like it's gonna shake out to be Baylor in the top 10 on the road. It, you can't paint much bigger. It should be the college game day game of the week. And it has a great case to be. So the, there's like, how as a football coach, do you tell your guys to not overhype this one up? How do you try to not, hey, take the revenge out of it, take the atmosphere out of it, just play football? Tough thing to do. Baylor and Dave Aranda have struggled to do that in the past, especially early last season and in year one. Pageantry, road games, the big time lights killed this team. Does that come back for a lot of the young guys on Saturday? I don't know. I I just don't see this game being, I don't see it being very high scoring. I think both teams end up somewhere in the 20s and I believe it to be a close game. Does Baylor blink because of the atmosphere? Can they out-athlete a BYU team that is bigger, faster, and stronger this season? And how how well will both of these squads approach the atmosphere they're going to get in Provo? Well, and that's the thing about it. I, I completely agree with your assessment there because it's going to be the first time for a lot of these BYU players playing at the 
Lavelle Edwards Stadium this season. And they love playing at home, obviously, because it's their home turf. But the crowd there last year, if, if any Baylor fan wants to know what Lavelle Edwards Stadium can be like, the, the, the hornet's nest it can become, Go back and watch the ASU game. It was game three for BYU a year ago. In a single drive, and ASU, no offense, they're about as undisciplined as any team out there. And But on a single drive, BYU's crowd induced, I believe, four fault start penalties on a single drive for ASU. Th this crowd, like I said, it's the most sober, crazy crowd you're ever going to see in your entire life. And th that's the thing about this. There are going to be a lot of BYU players who I think at the same time are going to be a little juiced because of the crowd and the, the energy in the stadium. And you're right. It, it, I could see this being a game, yeah, in the 20s, BYU, as of recording this podcast, is between a two and a three point favorite, depending on which sports book. Our friends, our sponsor, Bet Online, has it as a three point favorite yeah. for BYU, which uh, in betting parlance is a pick them. Uh, they give the home team three points just because. And so I, I see that that way. Now, I, I got a question for you, Drake. What player or players do you feel like this game could hinge on, or a guy that you feel like could be an X factor? It's got to be for Baylor Siaki Ika. With okay. Apu coming back into Utah, back in his old stomping grounds, grew up a BYU fan, someone who at one point in his life was committed to BYU and was looking at the campus through the lens of, I'm going to go play college football here. There's a lot on the line for him. It's not a revenge game. There's nothing personal in this game for him where he thinks, wow, I've got to prove it to this place that I'm that guy. It is the idea that, and, and it's in his culture too, of respect for mm -hmm. everything. And that's the mindset he comes into this game with. So I think Siaki Ika steps up big. The, the moment doesn't become too big for him, and he becomes a factor on the defensive line. Baylor's D-line is just huge. These guys, Gabe Hall was the athletic named him Baylor's biggest beast. He wasn't on my radar as a top three. So he kind of has jumped on the scene. Siaki Ika, as, as mentioned, Jackson player, a transfer from Tulsa. These guys are so big that they're going to need to dominate up front on the defensive line from get-go. They cannot blink the first possession. If BYU scores in their first possession of the game, I think Baylor's in legitimate trouble, and that's the way that this could go. I don't think Baylor wins by more than, more than if they do win, more than seven points. BYU could win by 14 if they get out early. This game is going to hinge on Siaki Ika and the defensive line for Baylor. Same question for you, Jake. What does it come down to for the Cougars? I think the biggest thing is how BYU's de – similar to Siaki Ika, BYU's defensive line, they've got to slow down this Baylor offensive line. These these two offensive lines, Baylor and BYU, they're top five offensive lines in the entire country. There's no, yeah. no, no doubt about it. I see BYU's offensive line – I look at this year's group of offensive linemen for BYU, I see five future NFL guys uh, yeah. across the line. And I think the same thing for Baylor. So – the question will be, can guys like Caden Hawes at nose tackle for BYU hold up? Can Lorenzo Fawate, who's actually missed the majority of the past two seasons playing defensive tackle, can he come in and make an impact? He didn't get a play last year against Baylor. He obviously wants to have a chance. Tyler Batty, who's BYU star pass rusher, can he force the action this year? He was ineffective, about as ineffective as he's been in his entire time at BYU against Baylor a year ago. He needs to have a bigger impact. So I think those three guys and obviously the guys around them along the defensive line for BYU, they have to slow down Baylor's rush attack. If they don't, this what happened last year in Waco could very much play out in Provo. Jake, this is the middle of the week, so mm -hmm. so much can change, and my score prediction is going to change consistently. <laughs> when you think about a final score, I don't even need a final score. I just yeah. want to know how you think it shakes out. Uh, so I, I see it like what you described, like you think Baylor could win it by seven. I think BYU is capable of winning this between three and 10 points in there. So if you wanted to know me down on a score, I'd kind of say something like BYU 28, Baylor 21 like or 24, somewhere in that range. I really think this could be how that game plays out. And the fun thing about that is that could be a 28 to 24 score line. That's about as entertaining a game as you would get potentially with like what we saw with app state in North Carolina, where it was 63 yeah. to 61. It, there are different games that have different score lines. They're just as entertaining as others. Just that you got to actually watch the game and enjoy it for what it is. Jake, in a game where every play feels like it matters with a huge weight, mm -hmm. Baylor somehow pulls it out in the end, 28, 24. Okay, so we're we're right there in now. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm going to take BYU 28-21. So I think we're right there in the, in the same same like ballpark, very very close at least. So that's the fun part. Well, Drake, any final thoughts before we call it a day? This this is the most fun week of college football. That we're we're two weeks in, by the way. But this, like I just don't see it getting too much bigger than this or better than this. I I couldn't be more excited for the plane ride, landing in Salt Lake, exploring Salt Lake, being in Provo, looking at the campus, being in the mountains. I'm I'm just giddy. 
I, I can tell you this much, Drake. I know you're from Texas, but I've got some barbecue here in Utah. I think it'll knock your socks off. So we're going to go get it. Yeah, look, I you've got a lot to live up to in that comment right there, so it better be good. I'm aware, but it is Texas, it is Texas barbecue, and it is in Utah, and it's legit. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure you're taken care of, my friend. Bring it on, Jake. All right, that's going to do it for this crossover edition of Locked On Cougars and Locked On Baylor. For Drake, I'm Jake. Have a great rest of your thank you. Once again, thank you for making us your first listen today. Want to encourage you guys, both uh, all of you out there, both Bears fans and Cougar fans, to check out Locked On Big 12. Josh Neighbors does an incredible job making sure you're up to speed on everything going on with the Big 12 Conference. Check that out wherever you get your podcasts, just like this one on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts in the normal audio form. That'll do it for us. Have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked On Cougars and Locked On Bears Pod, Locked On Baylor Podcast. See ya.